start it. Uh, first of all, welcome everybody to the Institute. It's an unusual time for a meeting, and this may well be reflected in the, in the numbers, but I, I think, as we will find, uh, there's a quality quantity issue which will uh, show itself. First of all, I'm Tony Brown, I'm a founder member of the Institute, currently called a senior fellow, and um, I, um, I've been asked to chair this because for a period uh, at the end of the last century, as I now say, I was a director of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, in which capacity I represented Ireland and Macedonia. I spent most of my time defending the use of the word Macedonia without the words former Yugoslav Republic of. Um, and uh, when I came back from that, uh, and I had been involved, of course, in the Institute before, we established a, a, a working group on the Balkans, which was for a while one of the most active groups in the Institute, and uh, in which the people of, like Misha Glenny and others, addressed us on a regular basis. But of course, eventually, uh, the enlargement process as a whole and the Western Balkans aspect of it died down as a, uh, a priority issue. And so the what Balkans group uh, ceased to, to, to be uh, as active as it was. Uh, but uh, on this afternoon's event is evidence of this. Uh, the issue is coming back on the agenda. And uh, we uh, have been, from the point of view of the Institute, that is objectively uh, significant, but also ties in with uh, work that we're doing in, in the group here that deals with the future of the Europe of 27. And uh, we are currently uh, discussing the whole issue on the basis of work done by our colleague John O'Brennan from Maynooth who's with us today. It's um, back on the agenda and I think it's going to be, particularly now in the light of what we're going to be discussing this afternoon, which is the very important communication from the Commission on the EU enlargement policy, which was published only just a matter of a week or so ago, and which is a, a very important contribution to the political debate in the institutions and hopefully in the member states. And we also have the prospect next month of the EU Western Balkans summit in Sofia under the Bulgarian presidency of the, of the Council, which um, would be seen as, as a, an occasion on which uh, further impetus can be given to the debate on further enlargement. So um, that provides the background to uh, this afternoon's event. Before I do any more, I've forgotten to do what everybody who sits in this chair is told, and that's to advise you to do the usual good deed with your mobiles, and also to reflect on the fact that were there to be an emergency, the emergency exits are the entrances through which you came, and not, as some people suggest, the windows, which probably would lead to even more emergencies, but uh, certainly the mobile phone uh, uh, either off or silent, if you please. So to discuss the preparation or the work that is going on to prepare for the eventual EU enlargement of the Western Balkans, we are very uh, privileged to have Archie Popovsky from the who is the director, Deputy Director General of DG Neighbourhood Policy and Enlargement Negotiations, or DG NEAR, uh, in, the, in the Commission, uh, who uh, is coming back to the Institute after a number of years. The records of the last Institute um, pre-presidency conference, mm -hmm. which was in 2012, show that you spoke there <coughs> on behalf of the uh, External Action Service. And, um, that you were, I think, also the, the Deputy Secretary General of that uh, institution uh, in, in the, in the uh, period uh, from 2011 to 2015. Mr. Popovsky has been in his present uh, role since April 2016 and uh, is responsible for the Southern Neighbourhood Relations of the uh, Union and uh, also has responsibility for migration 
issues and security issues in that part of Europe, which is a pretty heavy and, and, and serious uh, responsibility. Um, we, of course, have a, a, a background in the um, Polish Foreign Service and worked in the Prime pr pr of Poland in, in the Institute in, in uh, the early years of the decade, of the previous decade. Um, so um, we are very interested to hear your interpretation of the position that is emerging as enlargement comes back on the agenda. We of course remember that uh, when he took office, Commission President Juncker made it clear that there would be no enlargement on his watch, but that is moving towards the end and we're looking and recent statements uh, both from himself and other leading figures show that enlargement at least is coming back onto the agenda of policy consideration uh, and, and uh, the situation in the Western Balkans is particularly interesting in terms of countries that are already candidates, the countries that may be candidates and countries that are problematic in, in, uh, in various ways in terms of their status. So we will follow the usual pattern, the, your remarks, which we look forward to 20-25 minutes or so on the record and then a discussion off the record under what we call Europe House Rules but are really Chatham House Rules uh, adapted to Dublin and uh, that doesn't mean that they are not observed but uh, we like at times just to put our own little stamp on these things. So with that, uh, I'm welcoming you again, perhaps you would tell us what, what we are to expect under the rubric of this extensive work from your institution. You're very welcome. Yeah, and thank you very much. It's good to be back. It's good to see again some friends, Mary Cross, with whom I had the pleasure of serving on the Political and Security Committee, and General Ahern, who took me for a trip to Somalia, and this is something you never forget. Uh, but that was in my previous life. Now it's closer to home, this is the Balkans, and now the last couple of weeks uh, I, I basically feel like a traveling salesman because I'm going from capital to capital and, and talking about the strategy for the Western Balkans, both in the region and in the member states. And, and both uh, uh, work fronts are, are important. But it all started with the, uh, the big bank announcement of President Juncker in, in September of last year. When he spoke, when he gave this clear perspective, and that would really like, you know, there's this famous quote from Samuel Goldwyn that it starts with an earthquake and then things work their way up to the climax, and, and that was this earthquake moment for us because indeed President Juncker decided to uh, set the tone of a discussion and and in a way uh, make this uh, European perspective um, irreversible. Um, that was part of the State of the Union address mm. and, and it elevated enlargement to the priority policy areas of the Commission, where it belongs. Uh, for a number of reasons, we see it as a completion of a certain process that started in the 90s with the preparation for the 2004-2007 enlargements. Uh, it simply confirms that the place of Western Balkans is in Europe. I mean, they are surrounded by the European Union, they share the same values. Uh, they aspire to become members, uh, they just need a little bit of push and they, they need to do a lot of hold. But that's uh, But there are also challenges that, that we share, whether we want it or not. You mentioned some of them, the migration crisis. In a way, the, that was the most this defining moment in 2015 that has put back uh, Western Balkans on, on the European political agenda. So that up, to, uh, up to 2015, people thought of the region as a thing of the past. I mean, there were still some legacy issues, there was Kosovo, etc. But it was not much trouble. But then, then it came back with the vengeance, and then and there also uh, organized crime emanating from the region. There is terrorist threat. I mean, again, uh, there are linkages. Uh, we know of the foreign terrorist fighters originating from the Balkans. It's not as many as we think. Eh? It was 900 from the six countries, uh, which is double the amount of Belgian foreign fighters. Belgium is not that big. Um, but it is a threat. So we can only deal with this uh, in, a, in a European uh, uh, framework. And so we don't want to leave a security vacuum at our doorstep. And that's why we want to, uh, to re-engage. 
So, uh, as a next step, the Commission put forward a strategy, a, a framework paper that was issued in, uh, in, in February, that reaffirms this uh, window of opportunity, that sets a date. I mean, the date was mentioned by President Juncker, but then it was reconfirmed in the paper. And dates are always tricky, because they raise expectations. And the expect if the expectations are not met, people get frustrated. But that's life. When I, when I was on the receiving end, and uh, so negotiating Poland succession, we were also fighting for a date. And there were European leaders, I mean, who came to Warsaw and said that Poland should become a member of the European Union in 2000. It never materialized, so a lot of people got frustrated. Mm -hmm. Now, so the date that we put forward, 2025, is indicative and is, is, to, is to be seen as an incentive. So if everything goes well and the best prepared countries do the homework, they could possibly exceed. But they can also go back, and they can, they can, I mean, others can catch up, or they can even overtake the front runners. For timing, we have two, Serbia and Montenegro. It's factual, because they started the negotiations few years, few years back, they've made progress, they closed a few chapters, and they are more advanced in terms of their reforms. Uh, but we, um, uh, we really wanted to open up this perspective for everyone, all, I mean, for all the six countries, uh, some people call it a regatta <coughs> principle. So, uh, so well, they all move forward, and then we see who comes who comes in uh, first. Um, but of course, uh, they still need to uh, sustain the reform efforts um, and fulfill a number of conditions. On the conditions, uh, the Commission has always been very clear. We call it fundamentals first. I mean, they have to take. Uh, the commitment to the European values and the fundamental principles like the rule of law, functioning judiciary, fight against organized crime and state capture, they have to take it very seriously. We also expect the countries to settle in a binding way, we, we, we say in the, in the communication, all their uh, bilateral disputes. Because we have so many examples from the past where bilateral disputes were imported into the European Union. We would like to avoid it in the future. Uh, I mean, the main, uh, the one that is on everybody's mind is Kosovo, clearly, and and uh, and the the strategy is very straightforward. And that's saying that we expect a normalization of relationship between Serbia and Kosovo, and this has to be done in a legally binding way ahead of any accession. We are not prescribing a solution. It's for them to sort out, and the European Union is there to help. And that's the so-called Belgrade-Pristina dialogue that has been ongoing for some years. Um, uh, we, but we are not going to dictate the terms of the normalization to the countries uh, concerned. The economic reforms need to continue. I mean, uh, when you look at the candidate countries, none of them except Turkey is a real functioning market economy. I mean, they are, I mean the, the structure of the economies is heavily affected by the communist past, the question of ownership, but also competitiveness, level of investment, connectivity between them. I mean, it's, it's an issue. It's a relatively small region of 18 million people, but not really connected with each other. I started traveling to the Balkans when I joined the engineer, so that was two years ago. And then I discovered that the best way of getting from, uh, say, uh, um, uh, uh, Skopje to Belgrade is to go to Vienna. So that's the old pattern. Uh, so we want to help them improve the links, road network, uh, uh, energy uh, uh, infrastructure uh, between them. Um, an aspect that is really important is, is youth. Uh, this is a relatively young region. Uh, but faced with a very serious problem of brain drain. People are leaving because they have no job opportunities at home, are relatively well educated, are European, uh, and, and living very close to, to Europe. Um, so uh, it's difficult to stop. I mean, it's part of the trend. People go wherever they want to live, but, uh, but if we offer them something meaningful to do at home, they would be... They would be uh, motivated to, to stay um, and, and uh, to prepare the countries concerned for membership 
we decided to launch a number of, we call them flagship initiatives. It's six flagship initiatives. I'm going to come back to them in, in a moment. And also back them up with, with considerable funding. Uh, to give you only one figure, uh, until 2020, we want to top up the pre-accession assistance for the Western Balkan 6 by 500 million euros. Um, and then we need to prepare ourselves, the European Union, we need to think of financial implications. won't be that huge because it's not a, I mean, economically it's not a, a very, um, uh, I mean, it's not a, it's not a it won't have a huge economic impact on the European Union, uh, but there will be financial and uh, also institutional implications, uh, and etc. Um, now, the, um, what's on many people's mind in Europe, in particular uh, the countries, I mean the neighboring countries, but also some uh, uh, member states like France and Germany, is the, uh, uh, let's say, the negative phenomena like organized crime, state capture, foreign meddling, um, uh, pure, pure, um, state of, of judiciary. So um, there we have to be very firm and we have those famous list of chapters, negotiating chapters, and there are two, number 24 and 25, dealing with the rule of law with the judiciary, with the fundamental rights, and and this will be these will stay on the table until the very end. And we really want them to take these matters seriously, to deliver on judicial reforms, to fight against corruption and organized crime, to pursue a meaningful pu public administration uh, reform, and and to enhance the functioning of democratic institutions, including the parliaments. When you go around the region, you see that very often the opposition is marginalized. Sometimes it's at their own request. I mean, they simply boycott the parliament. But but even if they don't, they don't have much stake in. Well, that's the role of the opposition to be to be pushed by the government. That's normal. But but they need to play that role because otherwise there is no checks and um, and balances. So uh, the flagship projects that I mentioned, I will not go into all the details because that would be too too uh, boring and, and, and time consuming. But it's it six of them. First, strengthening the rule of law. And that's not just uh, something declaratory. We want to engage operationally on the ground. So, for instance, we will deploy a number of liaison officers of Europol, the European Police Agency, in the region. I mean, for the time being, it will be one per country, starting with three countries, uh, with Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and, uh, and Albania. Uh, but then once we will expand it. We want to have a good footprint of operational people be our eyes and ears on the ground, but also provide advice in the field of police reform, for instance. We will do something similar with not a network of liaison officers, but we will engage uh, with Eurojust, the, the prosecutor's network. We support the idea of having joint investigation teams in these countries. Uh, the second flagship is uh, uh, reinforcement engagement on security and migration. Migration, I mentioned already. Um, you may know that uh, the European uh, Border Management Agency Frontex has deployed their teams on the borders in Serbia and in former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, the guest officers we call them. We want to uh, continue that and help them manage the flows. Even though the situation is much less dramatic than it was in 2015, there are some still, still some people in transit and some people trying to cross the borders on the way to uh, European Union, be it Hungary or Croatia or Slovenia. The third flagship is uh, enhanced support for social economic development. Uh, so that's the investment in business climate and, and, and economy. Fourth, transport and energy, energy connectivity that I described already. Then a digital agenda for the Western Balkans. That's interesting because then we are looking ahead. Normally, you know, you. you because this is a relatively new uh, dimension of our daily life. Uh, we don't want them to have to catch up when they join. There are th certain things we can already prepare. So for instance, uh, you remember there was this uh, uh, European legislation uh, lowering and then eliminating roaming fees in the European Union, which is something of a di direct benefit to, to every citizen. 
Uh, well, I'm not saying it's going to happen in the Balkans tomorrow, but it should be happening at some point in time. We have to prepare that. We have to explain to the operators how to do that and, and if needed, back it up financially so that when the day comes, they can do the same. And this is sort of a healthy dose of populism in the sense that you do really something for, for the people because everybody has a mobile phone and everybody is traveling. And the last but not least, it's support for reconciliation and good neighborly uh, relations. Uh, it's not only those legacy issues that I mentioned, the bilateral disputes, but there is a huge need for reconciliation. I don't think I need to explain it to anybody in Ireland. Uh, we want to support that building on the best practices in our own countries, whether it's the reconciliation between Germany and France, or Germany and Poland, uh, or the, the peace process in Northern Ireland. Uh, there are people out there who can help. There are people out there who can share their experience. We want to facilitate that, uh, because the potential for conflict is there. I mean, it's not acute, it's not going to explode into our face tomorrow, but there is, something may happen. I was in Sarajevo on, on, on Monday, and uh, I had a, a series of meetings also fo focusing on security, internal security, organized crime, radicalization. And I was reassured by our own colleagues there, but also by NATO, still present, that the situation is fine. I mean, there is no reason to raise the, uh, the alarm level, so to speak, but it's not guaranteed. It, it's reversible. And, and the way of, of addressing the root causes of, of potential conflict is to deal with all those <coughs> open wounds from, from the past. And it's only 20, 25 years ago that it happened. So um, uh, we need to invest in that uh, heavily. So I think our uh, roadmap is pretty clear. Uh, we have our marching orders. We are assessing all these countries regularly. You mentioned the report that was uh, adopted by the Commission last week. That's the so-called enlargement package. So the six country reports on the Western Balkans and Turkey, very detailed. Mm -hmm. So going uh, with the thing come through all the criteria, the Copenhagen criteria for membership, and and assessing. Uh, I think it's it's rather fair. Uh, and we don't do it ourselves. We, we really uh, reach out to everyone, uh, to, to our own delegations, but also to uh, international organizations like, I don't know, Council of Europe, OEC, or OECD and others to help us with these assessments. So I think they are really well balanced, giving a fair picture of, of the state of preparedness, and that's, that, that's an annual uh, exercise. Uh, the novelty was a clear recommendation to start accession talks with Albania and form Yugoslav Republic and Macedonia. Uh, because they've made sufficient progress, in particular judicial reforms and, um, and, and governance reforms, um, so there are still issues out there. There is the ongoing negotiations on the name of the country with Greece, and that there we, we keep our distance because it's really a bilateral issue and, and the UN is involved, but we hope if they manage to find a solution, which uh, seems perfectly feasible, and then it would open the door for uh, accession negotiations. By the way, also uh, would open the door to NATO, uh, because uh, Ireland would also like to, to join the, the alliance. Albania has made considerable progress on the, I mean, in, in the judiciary, when it comes to the judiciary, uh, and, and the government is doing a good job, so we hope in June, when the member states are going to uh, of conclusions on enlargement, we hope that they would follow our recommendation. But it's still, uh, well, I mean, we are we are still looking at a, a few bumpy weeks uh, ahead of us in in, in Brussels. Um, and then, um, indeed, our leaders will meet in Sofia with the counterparts from the six countries. That's this moment <coughs> of confirmation of the European perspective. Uh, we really want to keep it on the agenda. Um, and then there's still a lot of, I mean, I wouldn't say blood, sweat and tears. I mean, it's enough blood that has been spilled in the, in, in the region, but certainly sweat and tears uh, for, for us and, and for them. Uh, but, but the direction of travel is clear. What we still need to do is to communicate that. Uh, it is a historical opportunity and we need to close the circle. We need to complete a certain process, but it's not obvious anymore. And then I'm, I'm a byproduct of the 2004 enlargement. I joined the commission in 2008 only. Uh, 
And but but back in the 90s, it was pretty obvious that the EU has to enlarge. Mm. Uh, now this this realization is no longer there. We uh, that's why why the communication is so uh, uh, clear on that, uh, and we have to reach out to. EU audiences in the capitals to the parliaments, NGOs, wider audiences. That's why I appreciate opportunities like, like this one. I mean, to explain. Uh, in some cases, it's difficult because you are faced with criticism, uh, but it's absolutely key because otherwise we we lose uh, we risk losing a good outcome whenever whenever it whenever it comes. Um, so uh, this will certainly will s will spend no effort, uh, sort of reaching out and, and explaining the rationale and, and how we want to uh, to go about it. But uh, um, once again, I would like to reassure everyone that that we take it seriously and we are very firm on on the fundamental parameters and the fundamental values of the European uh, Union that we expect the uh, countries concerned to um, to respect. Um, I think I will stop here. Uh, and then we have uh, enough time for a, for a discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you.